It's News and Views for the week of January the 22nd. We have a new segment that we're going to start this year, and it's called the Sun City, Texas Resident of the Month. And we have chosen several people who are going to be, uh, we're going to come into their homes and we're going to talk about their lives. And usually uh, they have been very uh, unique types of experiences for the last 40 or 50 years. And so we're really having a lot of fun with pre-interviewing and talking with our Sun City Residents of the Month. For January, I'd like to introduce to my left, Dr. Charles M. Barnes. Good morning. Good morning to you, Judy. How are you? Well, I think I'll make it. Sure no, the I world. Think, I think so, too. So let's get started. Charles has had a very extensive career, and uh, we're going to uh, have some lots of fun talking about all of his accomplishments. Dr. Charles M. Barnes was born and raised in Rising Star, Texas, and he married Anna Rose in 1943, whom he met at Texas A&M. We'll meet Anna soon. They have been married 63 years and have four children, two boys and two girls. We'll talk about the family shortly. Welcome, Charles, and okay. thank you for being part of our new segment called the Sun City Resident of the Month. Thank you. So let's start with your teenage years. Your father died when Charles was 12. He and his older brother and family ran a dairy farm, processed milk, and then delivered it to the town of Rising Star. Tell us a little bit about the dairy and what happened one day when the pigs got sick. Well, pigs had nothing to do with the dairy, but um, other than we fed the extra milk to the pigs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is my personal story. It's uh, I, I am a veterinarian, and uh, a lot of people think, well, they know all about veterinarians since they take their dog to the doctor or something once in a while, or a kitty cat or something. But I'm one of those unusual people who has not done much practice. And so if you're going to ask me some advice, don't ask me. You better go <laughs> find another veterinarian. <laughs> but I did have an unusual uh, career, and that's what we'll talk about today. Okay. And I realized that the people that uh, I was associated with are unique. Um, and so it may be that uh, my wife herself is a unique person. Absolutely. And uh, she is one of those persons that have enough uh, gumption to work with me and <laughs> stay stay and keep being like my helper and, and uh, a person who has uh, enriched my life. <clears throat> so the teenage years now, you were on the dairy farm. Yeah. And what, what happened one day? Well, every day. It gets up, you get up at 5 in the morning and go out and milk the cows. We milked 26 head of cattle. And um, this was during the time of the Depression. Mm -hmm. My brother and I often wonder, why in the world did my father go into the dairy business? First of all, he was superintendent of schools uh, in Rising Star at the time, and he didn't need to be a dairyman. No. But it turned out that he thought that dairying would be great, and so he, he did uh, buy some high-priced dairy cattle mm -hmm. and uh, $300 a piece. Whoa. <laughs> Originally, uh, the such cattle we may could have bought them for less than $50 a yeah. head. But then, unfortunately, your father died. Yes, he, uh, he, did, he did die, and he was 64 when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack and I carried on with uh, delivery of milk. Okay. I've t told Judy the other day, I said, I've never seen a, a dairyman anymore that will deliver a half a pint of milk. And do you know what we sold it for? No. Two cents for a half a pint of milk. Okay. Of course, we doubled that price, uh, four cents for a pint. Yeah. And eight cents That's for a quart. quart. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we were doing okay with right. that. and. Uh, that was a, a hard life, though, yeah, for, for you. Yeah, for a teenager. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then uh, you said you had the hogs, but you noticed they weren't feeling well. So oh, that's right. What that happened? Hogs were dying, actually. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my vocational ag teacher said, well, you need to get you a veterinarian to see what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't have any local veterinarians in the county, and you'll have to call the state veterinarian in Fort Worth. Okay. Well, he called on the phone and said, please come and give us some advice about these sick hogs. Well, the next day, here came a guy in a big black Buick car, all shined up, and uh, he had on a pair of boots that I've never seen any better ones in my life, and 
teenage boys in the Rising Star are very impressed with boots. <laughs> so when this uh, veterinarian came aboard uh, at our house and, uh, and he had these nice boots, I was impressed. Yep. So if he uh, noticed what he was going to do, he pulled off his boots, put on some rubber boots. He then uh, got some disinfectant and put it in a steel bucket and started to, to, out, to autopsy these pigs. Mm -hmm. He said, yep, that's what you got, is some hog cholera. Mm -hmm. He said, now you're not gonna get rid of it very easy, but you'll have to get them vaccinated. So okay. uh, that's what I thought to myself. A guy got on his car and took off back for Fort Worth. I said, so that's what a veterinarian does. <laughs> that was an easy uh, chore for him to do. Yeah, right. So the vocational education said, why don't you become a veterinarian? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I thought, well, how can I do that? And they said, well, there's only one place to go to school, mm -hmm. and that's Texas A&M. Yeah. That's the only veterinary school within four or five states around, around. Texas. Around, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I decided we, we better do it. And he said, well, it's cheap for you to go because they have ROTC, mm -hmm. Reserved Officer Training mm -hmm. Camp right. uh, group in at College Station and said, y'all you need to do, you, they'll furnish you a uniform. It don't cost much money for clothing, yeah, yeah. but you will have to buy you some shoes. So when I was a freshman in, in high school, I said, I'm not gonna buy anything but brown shoes that will match a, a uniform. uniform. <laughs> okay. So I bought brown shoes for four years, <laughs> getting prepared to go to Texas A&M. Yeah, right. okay. So uh, Charles graduated from high school, the top of his class, and with $65 yeah. in his pocket, he hitchhiked to College Station. Yeah. During the four years at Texas A&M, you worked jobs along with your studies and graduated in 1944. He also met his Anna, his sweetheart of 63 years, and yeah. they were married in 1943. And if the camera can pick it up, this is a picture of Charles and Anna as they were courting this way. You met uh, at a church, right? Yes. Okay. Can you see that? Okay, great. So that's a nice, great picture, and that was taken in the early 40s. After passing the DVM test for licensing, Charles began practicing in his hometown area, right? He and Anna also studied and served as missionaries, and in 1947, the USDA needed veterinarians to go to Mexico to control and eradicate the hoof and mouth disease. Charles, Anna, and daughter Polly spent three years in central Mexico. That's right, and uh, we found it a, a very desirable thing to do. And the other day, uh, some Texas veterinarians made up a certificate and presented it with this certificate oh. right there. All right saying that uh, I was one of the pioneers in, in, uh, in the eradication of foot and mouth disease. Yeah. So uh, it, was a, it was a real joy to be able to serve with those people. Absolutely, to be part of that. And you consider that one of the greatest achievements of veterinary medicine. That's true. Okay. In 1950, Charles became the regional veterinarian for three parishes in the Lake Charles area of Louisiana. You were working on the elimination of Brook Brucellosis. Brucellosis and tuberculosis when the Korean War began. That's right. And what was your comment about the Korean War? You said... Well, I didn't, I didn't want another war to come along without my being part of it. Okay. Uh, uh, I was in the World War II for a short period of time. The last few months of my veterinary schooling uh -huh. was actually was paid for by the Army. By the Army, right. And okay. so uh, I said, I, I'm going to get in, but I'm going to go in the Air Force this time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. People may wonder what a veterinarian does in the Air Force. I said, well, there's always ramjets, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like this, which is, of course, there is ramjets, but that had nothing to do with being it. <laughs> a veterinarian in the, in the Air Force primarily is a food inspector. Right. And I, I, I was responsible in my first duty station for about one third of the total of New York State. Okay. And uh, we bought uh, milk and meat products and mm -hmm. uh, for a 30,000 man base at Sampson Air Force Base, New, New York. York. Okay, all right. And it says that uh, you uncovered a lot of fraud. There was a lot of, they were passing things off as something else and- Always there's something going on. Yeah, some uh, scam, huh? Some scam. And uh, like, for example, and some of you may be looking at your butter at the present time, mm -hmm. but they were f putting in Crisco in with mixing it with the butter, 
and selling it for a higher price, sure. trying to. Of course, we caught them at t tricks like that. Yeah, yeah. They even sold us some horse meat, trying to tell us, was beef. trying to sell us horse meat, <laughs> telling us that's beef and it's yeah. sure not. And so we, we, uh, we always earned our salt. I guess so. Charles's next assignment was the Atomic Energy Commission Plutonium Production Plant in Washington State to study the effects of radioisotopes on animals, fish, and fowl. He also worked in Nevada. Tell That's us a right. little bit about that. Well, uh, as all of you remember, or many of you remember at least, uh, old timers like myself, during World War II, we did bomb the Japanese with bombs, atomic bombs, and we killed about 90,000 Japanese. And all of a sudden, our uh, people in the headquarters said, well, what are we going to do if the Russians bomb us? Uh, at that time, the Russians were considered our enemy. Mm -hmm. Today, we don't think of them as enemies anymore. But in those days, we did. And so uh, we wanted to find out what would happen if the Russians uh, bombed us. Awesome. And we had to have animals to simulate people. Absolutely. Uh, an animal uh, like a pig is about the same size as a man, mm -hmm. uh, sheep, goats are about the same size, and so you can use them as an experimental sure. animal okay. for that purpose. Right. So across the country, more and more veterinarians were assigned to obtain knowledge on fallout from right. the nuclear weapons. That's okay. right. Okay. In 1954, a new weapon, the hydrogen bomb, arrived. Charles was assigned to the South Pacific to capture rats, birds, and measure their radioisotope content. He observed firsthand the blast, fallout, and what was called the nuclear dawn. Will you tell us about that? Yeah, I was uh, very shocked. Actually, I'd already been to see atomic bombs go in Nevada. Uh -huh. But then when they brought me out to see a hydrogen bomb go off, uh, and to study the effects of the hydrogen bomb, I was very shocked to find we were about 50 miles away from the nuclear explosion and my face got red hot uh, and I had to get behind the ship's railing mm -hmm. because it could destroy your life. I mean, it could kill you because even 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the things that I observed. The other thing is the noise itself. We would get up early maybe in the morning, uh, watch a blast go off and say, oh, I'll read a newspaper if you wish from the nuclear dawn. And uh, then we'd go to the breakfast hall and, and sit down to the table to have breakfast. About the time you sit down, which is say 18 minutes from the time you went and saw the nuclear dawn, uh, over on Inuitak Atoll, uh, Bikini Atoll rather, mm -hmm. Uh, wham! They just shot off a weapon over there, and uh, it took about uh, 12 minutes for it to get over to yeah. us, the shock. Right, so they and, did just vibration. Vibration, and it would shake our table and, and uh, do a good job of letting us know that, yeah, we had a good hydrogen bomb explosion over on on, on bikini. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you uh, also observed um, this island where uh, there was all these yeah. people. The first time I got there, we actually went with a ship, and that's one of the reasons I was up, up oh, on the sure. deck. Right. Uh, because the uh, people f f in that in that atoll had been exposed to fallout from the first uh, hydrogen bomb blast. That was 30, 300 miles away from uh, the blast site, mm -hmm. and yet it was shattered with enough uh, material that looked like oatmeal or oat flakes from oatmeal, mm -hmm. and uh, they, it would uh, make these people sick, and they were getting sick, and so we went over to examine them and to move them to a new atoll. Okay. So we did that, and uh, it was a, a very interesting experience to see these people and see the back of the neck and other places where they were, were uh, uh, singed with a hydrogen bomb uh, debris. The fallout. And this yeah. was something that you yeah. that came from the sky, right? No. Uh, yeah. It, it was blown we, up. There, we had one atoll, uh, excuse me, one island that disappeared. 
And uh, on the first year, the first hydrogen bomb went off, and uh, of course, the, all the material underneath the weapon would go up in the air and fall back down. This was right at the edge of the crater. This is pencil coral. Mm -hmm. And um, so when we had nothing else to do, we would pick up a few pieces like this, and I would label them with a piece of uh, mm -hmm. Of uh, copper, yeah. and says which says this is the first uh, from the first hum atomic uh. first hydrogen bomb uh, test mm -hmm. at Inuita Atoll, and of course it's a nice souvenir for me, and it's still radioactive, by the way. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not that radioactive, but yeah. it's still but it, that that happened years. fifty some odd yeah, years ago. Yeah, I was going to say that happened all these years. Ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Obviously, it was first-hand observation and all the, yeah. all the things that you did. In 1957, Charles graduated from the University of California at Berkeley with a Ph.D. in medical physics. Okay? With the additional training, Dr. Barnes was assigned to observe the Weapons Systems 125A, which was a nuclear-powered plane. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. They Aircraft, of course, is one that did not require any, any gasoline or anything like that. You can uh, start the motor and the engine, and then the plane will fly uh, without uh, uh, any, excusing any, any gasoline or what have you. The purpose of this, of course, was to be in the air uh, over uh, the, uh, well, the, Antarctic, uh, Arctic region, Arctic, uh, Arctic Alaska, region. But, yeah, yeah assuming that the Russians were going, if they came to attack us, they would yeah. come over that region. Right. Yeah. And so this airplane was supposed to destroy uh, any Russians that would show mm -hmm. up. Yeah, uh, this was obviously the Cold War, and it was a great yeah. threat during those years. That's correct. The project unfortunately cost two hundred billion dollars a year, so Congress quickly snuffed out that program. In 1958 to 1963, Charles was in Rockville, Maryland, working on the Atomic Energy Commission as the nuclear sa safety officer. All this work was top secret, of course. Yes. In an overseas assignment, came in 63 to 67, as director of the Migratory Animal Pathological Survey, which is MAPS. Charles worked in eight countries in the area, capturing two million birds, removing parasites from them, banding them, and taking blood samples. The U.S. Air Force was doing this in case they might have military operations in the area and in the future. Of course, Vietnam was very soon after that. That's oh, correct. Tell us a little bit about some of that uh, project. Well, uh, the, the idea was to look at birds that go from country to country, realizing that particulates from the fallout from the weapons themselves mm -hmm. or fallout from a, a plant that's manufacturing uh, plutonium weapons or something of this nature. And uh, then you can tell uh, all about the uh, nat what is the nature of the, of the weapon itself. Uh, plus, not only that, but you can uh, see if there's going to be uh, where the, how far the birds are going to travel. Mm -hmm. if, for example, if we were thinking that, uh, that maybe the Chinese were getting ready to build a bomb, if we find that uh, the, their thyroids and the other glands of the birds mm -hmm. uh, were radioactive, they know that they are in the process of doing this. Same thing is true of uh, the Indians and uh, people in, in North Korea as well. Okay. So that was, now we're into the Vietnam area, area, era, excuse me. In 1966, Charles got back to basics as a staff veterinarian at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. He worked with the U.S. Aid Department, particularly eradicating the parasites and other noxious in, insects by spraying them, and you were using recycled aircraft to do that. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, Air Force people fly on a constant basis. Mm -hmm because that's the reason you're in the Air Force. And uh, so they will fly from, uh, say, from Eglin Air Force Base over to uh, Las Vegas, which is a good place to go, uh, and then fly back. And uh, in the meantime, 
if you go down fly low and you can release uh, insecticides and get rid of mosquitoes, uh -huh. other insects and, th and things in, of that nature in root. So it's a pretty neat system to yeah. do uh, work, that kind of work. And you were recycling aircraft from World War II and Korea War? Yeah. And that, and These aircraft went to Vietnam and, and uh, removed uh, any, a lot of okay. brush and stuff that was in the okay. way of research. Absolutely. In 1968, NASA called, come to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The assignment was radiation protection with the astronauts going to the moon. Charles? Well, as you may or may not know, the, <clears throat> the Earth is surrounded by radiation belts. They go out several thousand miles from uh, the Earth. If our astronauts are proceeding through these belts to go to the moon, uh, we have to know all about them. I don't know what's happening to them while they're en route. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually uh, prepared a uh, bunch of safety devices such as dosimeters to be put on the on the uh, astronaut plus in the in the cabin itself. Yeah. And this uh, eagle uh, right here is a gift uh, from NASA to me and uh, to three other people for producing these new dosimeters. This indicates if you got an eagle that uh, you saved the government $25 million. And so that's one of the uh, things that... That's what you're working on. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing uh, uh, is it's we used a thousand monkeys through a period of uh, about four or five years there mm -hmm. uh, trying to find out uh, what is the lack of uh, life or depth, death, death uh, rate of monkeys and people, they're simulating people, mm -hmm. uh, if they go over and get an amount of radiation that one would get going to the moon mm -hmm. or out into outer space. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is the kind of research we were doing, checking with monkeys, checking with people, checking with uh, dogs, uh, okay. all kinds of animals to uh, look at what is, is occurring. Radiation levels, right. right. For 14 years, Charles was at NASA, and a crowning moment was Apollo 11, we all remember that. When it, when it arrived on the moon, he penciled a note to the mission surgeon, which read, I said, uh, well, dear sir, uh, we have just made the calculations and the measurements on the Apollo 11 spacecraft as it lands on the moon, and it, it is safe to land. There is not enough radiation in that area to keep them from landing. I'm sure they would have gotten off of the spacecraft anyway if, if I had yeah. written, written that note, yeah. but it kind of pleased me to say I had a part in it. Absolutely. And if the guys are going to get off and they're going to get off safely, yeah. Uh, then uh, I, uh, the fact that I've told them that is mm -hmm. is great. Yeah, Tranquility Base, they are safe for the crew to exit the spacecraft. That's right. During those 14 years, Charles retired from the U.S. Air Force as Colonel in 1981, serving for 30 years. He continued at NASA until 1982, and after 40 years of government and private work, he concluded it was time to retire near Rising Star, Texas, on a 250-acre ranch. And we're going to stop right here because Anna Barnes will join us. We welcome Anna Barnes to the couch. Thank you. This is Charles's sweetheart of 63 years. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit later as we go in because obviously Charles and all of his projects and, and his career, there were times when he was not home. Yes. And you had four children <laughs> yes. to take care of. So <laughs> yes. we're going to talk about that in a minute. But Charles had reminded me that if you can zero in on this, this is a uh, EKG of Neil Armstrong as he stepped off into the moon, on the moon. Pretty, pretty calm guy. Pretty calm guy. So this is a, a, a wonderful keepsake for Charles. All right. You got to the ranch and um, decided you retire for the first time, right Anna? Yeah, he did. He did. He you, decided you, we retired. He decided. 
but the u s d a had other ideas asking charles and anna to go to the panama area as a supervisory veterinarian for central america no retirement yet Nope. Tell us, so, Anna, a little bit about the, the conditions there in Panama. Well, it was great yeah. because, number one, there's a big military base, All right. English, okay. where everybody speaks English. I did know some Spanish, but Panamanian Spanish is a little, little better a little than my Mexican Spanish that okay. I had learned in Mexico. Okay. But it was a great place to be stationed. We had a home. Uh, we got to go rent whatever we wanted to live in, and we were up looking down at the Panama Canal. Oh, my goodness. From our, res from our apartment. Okay. We, we got an apartment. So okay. It was a great place to live. So after three years, you left, mm -hmm. and you tried to retire again. But no, they, the USA Department wanted Charles to go to Pakistan to work as a veterinarian and to purchase 20,000 mules for the resistance finders who were from Ma uh, Afghanistan, but now they were in Pakistan trying to get back to. Tell us a little bit about the about purchasing and all that. Well, uh, first of all, the Afghani uh, are the ones that we're trying to repl uh, supply with mules. Right. Uh, they have to have supplies if they're going to go home because all the supplies have been decimated by the Russians in their war. Uh, and so the idea was if we can give them mules and they can form a pack train, they can go over the mountains up a 13, 14,000 level, uh, feet level. Mm -hmm. Of, of altitude going over back to Afghanistan. So that's what we did. And unfortunately, or fortunately for us and them too, uh, they, uh, some, we donated a few missiles mm -hmm. to, to the, the, the people riding on the back of the mule and they were shooting down one Russian aircraft a day, uh, average, uh, with uh, the mules. Mm. So, um, uh, it's sort of interesting to find that you can actually have a pretty fine war on from the back of a mule. <laughs> and the veterinarians come into the place in order that to see that the mules are in good shape and, right. and, uh, and can actually make the trip. Right. Well, unfortunately, Charles suffered a heart attack and they had to return to the ranch to recuperate. He then started growing shiitake mushrooms but after the second heart attack, it was definitely time to retire. Ann and Charles moved to Sun City in 1996, mm -hmm. only the fourth home to be occupied. In fact, you looked out your back window and saw what? Cows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Charles said, this, We're home. He said, If I can have this house, yeah. we'll move to Sun City. Okay. Because that reminds me of the ranch where That's we right. left our cows. <laughs> They continue here in Sun City after all these years to be part of the nature and garden clubs and the theater group. Now, Charles and Anna, I, after pre-interviewing and interviewing, you are two of the hardest working couples I know. Now, your assignments, of course, were having and raising the children, sometimes by yourself, mm -hmm. also serving as a partner, a cook. You were in Mexico, you yeah, were the I cook. Cooked, I cooked for all the men. Yeah. Molly, I was a little, about three years old, and yeah. Paul and I lived in a trailer, cook trailer, and the only reason we did that, that's the only way we would be with him, yeah. was to go out from Mexico City and, and live on the trailer, and, and I, they needed a cook, so I did. So, so it was just the cook and the confidant. Yeah. Charles and Anna were and are a team for the last 63 years. Right. Your children are Polly, and she has a master's in psychology. Mm -hmm. John is a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Molly is a wife and mother and has a career in the insurance business, mm -hmm. and James is a mortgage broker. Mm -hmm, right. Sounds like they're very, very successful. They have, you have nine grandchildren and one great-grandchild, correct? Is that right? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Charles has retired from the U.S. Air Force, the USDA, NASA, Foreign Diplomatic Service, the veterinary practice of 41 years, he was also a consultant to WHO, which is the World Health Organization. He was a consultant with the University of Texas at Houston in their public health department. He was president of the International Veterinarian Medical Foundation in 2001 and served in 22 foreign countries. Wow. <laughs> wow. Lots of fun. Whoa. Everybody should do it. Oh, I guess so. We've only been able to touch the surface of his career and the lives of Charles and Anna Barnes, but it has been a pleasure interviewing you. 
Thank you for being a part of our program and our lives. Your con contributions to the world are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.